And a government that's that big, that takes that much of your money, that uh, is big enough and powerful enough to spy on you, to lie to you, to target you, is a government that we ought not have in the first place. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Senator Mike Lee, a Republican from Utah who first won election in 2010. He's the author of Our Lost Constitution, The Willful Subversion of America's Founding Document, which is just out in paperback, and the founder of the Article One Project, which seeks to restore Congress to the status of first among equals in the federal government. Thanks for talking to us, Senator. Thank you. The Article One Project, which you announced earlier this year, seeks to restrain the powers of the judicial branch, but especially the executive branch. For those of us who are not lawyers, explain why Congress should be top dog among three co-equal branches of the federal government. Congress should be top dog within its own sphere, which is lawmaking. Right now it's not. And the idea isn't so much about taking power away from the other branches as much as it is putting the power that involves lawmaking back in the hands of Congress. Bad things happen when we delegate out that power to the executive branch and the judicial branch, as we've been doing for decades. Yeah, so give, uh, give a couple of examples in which uh, the president overstepped his legitimate powers or the, uh, and the Supreme Court uh, did the same. Okay, so some of the best examples of those are the most obvious ones when the president uh, decided to make four recess appointments on January 4th, 2012 during a time when the Senate was not, in fact, in recess. Right. Uh, it was unprecedented. Eventually, the Supreme Court got that one right. And mm -hmm. It took us a while to get there. That was a rather obvious excess, and that was one where the president was to blame. There are lots of other areas, though, where there's too much power in the executive branch, and it's actually Congress's fault. Right. Because Congress has stopped being the lawmaker. Congress, instead of passing laws, has started giving homework assignments to executive branch agencies. So they, yeah, they just say the agencies, you guys come up with the regulations or the way these things will be implemented. Sometimes what Congress does, instead of actually making a law, deciding how to address a problem, let's take clean air, for example, instead of Congress coming up with a comprehensive uh, system for pollution limits, Congress will instead perhaps pass a law that says we shall have clean air. And we hereby delegate to the EPA the power to create rules carrying the force of, of federal law that will define what clean air means, that will define uh, what pollution is, set acceptable pollution limits, prescribe penalties for polluters. And then, by the way, EPA will have the power to enforce the laws that it has already created. Now, this turns the EPA into a super legislature and executive. That's a problem, especially because people at the EPA, as hardworking and as smart as they might be, they don't work for the people. They, they don't ever stand for election. Um, now, your colleagues in the Article One project uh, include people like Jeb Harnsel, Hensarling, Mia Love, Rand Paul, Jeff Flake, others, but they're all Republicans. How do we know this isn't just about the GOP sticking it to a Democratic administration? It's, it's not, especially because our plan, my goal, is eventually to turn it into a bipartisan thing. We would like to make enough of a case that eventually we'll have Democrats who will want to join us in this, recognizing that this is ultimately neither Republican nor Democratic, neither liberal nor conservative. This is just a good governance sort of a thing. Most importantly, it's a constitutional thing. What are some of the ways in which, say, uh, George W. Bush or, or Republican presidents overstepped their bounds? I was concerned uh, when George W. Bush signed into law legislation in the campaign finance arena. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that he, in signing it, voiced significant constitutional concerns and then said, we'll let the courts work out the constitutional issues. Um, it's a different kind of overreach, but it's overreach nonetheless. It's overreach and underreach combined because uh, presidents are uh, themselves independently accountable to the Constitution. Like every other federal officer, they're required to swear an oath to uphold and protect and defend the Constitution. What happened to Congress? Why did it, why did it become so spineless? In essence, what happened was that Congress, starting uh, during the New Deal era, created these big executive branch agencies and started delegating power. Initially, Congress sort of uh, appeased itself by saying, we're going to have the last word. We're going to put in a provision of law that, uh, although we're delegating all this legislative power on X, Y, or Z to agency A, B, or C, we will give ourselves the power to veto any regulation they come out with that we don't like. So even though the agencies will be the real lawmakers, will have the last word. That worked, it worked well, it was popular for about 50 years. Uh, we had hundreds of these legislative veto provisions on the books and it, and it made Congress feel still like it was in charge. 
then the Supreme Court decided a case called INS v. Chadha in the mid-1980s. They said that was unconstitutional. A lot of people thought at that point that Congress would stop delegating its lawmaking power. It didn't. It got worse. You see, what happened was Congress became addicted to this practice because it made it so easy for members of Congress to seek and obtain their holy grail, which is perpetual re-election. Okay, yeah, and then they're simultaneously they can take credit for passing a good law, but they're not responsible for the, the dirty details. All of the credit, none of the blame. That's so, the problem. So what are the specific measures that you and your colleagues in the Article One project, and you talk about this in the book, anticipating it, um, you know, to reel in executive power, uh, and explain the, the content and the current status of the, of the act that you've put together, the regulations from the executive in need of scrutiny act, or the RAINS Act, like you're reining things in. What's going on with the that? The RAINS Act is perhaps the single most important feature, or the, the definitely the, the first step that ought to be taken. Uh, that could restore a lot to separation of powers. What the RAINS Act says is that anytime you have an executive branch agency making a new law, something that is in effect a new law imposing obligations on the public, uh, something that has a significant economic cost attached to it as measured by the OMB. And w would that be a hundred million dollars yes. in yes. the economy? So uh, it's similar to the regulation mm -hmm. that uh, the limit for regulation that it's called for uh, higher scrutiny. Precisely, yeah. precisely. It's, it's known as a major rule right. in regulatory parlance. Uh, the, uh, all new major rules would have to be run back through Congress. In other words, it's not a, uh, a veto where Congress just says, no, you can't do it, but it, it, it says this won't take effect unless Congress right affirmatively enacts it into law and then the president signs it. What are the odds of that passing anytime soon? How many sponsors? Things like that. Okay, it has passed the House each year, every year, for about the four, last four or five years in a row. We have yet to have a straight up or down vote on it in the United States Senate. I, I'm continually pushing Well, maybe if that your out. party gains control of the Senate, you could actually engineer that, right? Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> One of the problems is that we do have a president who wouldn't sign it. Right. My hope is that with the change in administrations, regardless of who the next mm -hmm. president is, maybe there will be a, an, a new mood, especially if there is a Republican president, who knows, a libertarian president. Right. Uh, perhaps Democrats in the House and Senate will be more eager to see this for what it is, which is a a nonpartisan issue. Yeah. They should be concerned about this just from a separation of powers well, standpoint. Well, and, and this is in the lost constitution. You talk, you know, the, this, the, the RAINS Act, the Article One project all flow neatly from your book. What do voters have to do in order to, to see this kind of change? Voters, I think, have to first and foremost start focusing on the fundamental structural uh, protections in the constitution. So in order for the Bill of Rights to work, in order for any other substantive protection in the Constitution to work, we have to have our structural protections in place. The vertical protection we call federalism, which tells us to govern locally most of the time, except when it's unavoidably national and recognized as national by the Constitution. And we have the horizontal protection we call separation of powers. If voters, Republicans, Democrats, independents, libertarians, if voters would all recognize that the, uh, almost every ailment we have in the federal government is due in one way or another to our neglect of federalism, uh, federalism and separation of powers. And if we would make these constitutional terms part of our national political discourse, this would revolutionize America. You talk about having, you know, that people should talk to their friends about, read the Constitution, talk about the Constitution. Is that very likely? Yes, it is likely. There have been times in the past where that has happened, where people were more conversant in the Constitution. It was part of the national political discourse. George Washington himself, right after the Constitution was drafted, before it was ratified, predicted that this would be the case, and this is uh, something that he predicted would be the great safety valve. So can in, you in, do in product placement where it's like keeping up with the Kardashians and the Constitution or something? But this <laughs> is, I mean, what you're seeking is, you know, for us to actually take, take our a political document seriously. Yeah, yeah, to popularize it. And uh, this book tells uh, the stories behind it in a way that makes it familiar. Yeah, which is uh, something I should point out. The book is, I mean, it's filled with stories. It is not a law lecture or, uh, you know, a set of regulations. So it's, it's quite uh, impressive. And you uh, kind of anticipated, I mean, you write about Alexander Hamilton a lot, and you, you kind of got there before the uh, the hit Broadway musical even. So. You know, as I recall, it hit Broadway right about the time that uh, the hardcover yeah. version of my book was hitting. And um, I remember thinking, gosh, there are some parallels here, because I talk a lot about Hamilton in my book. One of the reasons why I think that play is so popular is that mm -hmm. people are curious about the founding generation. They instinctively know that 
those guys did something right. They had something right. Uh, speaking of curiosity about the Constitution, your party, the presumptive nominee, is Donald Trump, who seems to have very little knowledge of the Constitution. I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem like he spent a lot of time studying it or he could pick it out of a, out of a lineup of other founding documents. Um, he also seems, from the way he talks, that he would be very in favor of enlarging executive power immensely. Hillary Clinton is part of the Obama administration, which has overstepped its bounds time and time again. Who do you think would be worse in terms of you know, making a really imperial presidency? That is a little bit difficult to, to predict accurately and completely because we, we don't know entirely how someone would behave mm -hmm. as president until they're actually in office. That is always the case. I will say this, though. I have a presumption. There's a presumption that I think is fair to make these days that almost any president, unless that president is uh, decisively different and unless that candidate announces an intention to be different if elected, you have to assume that that president will pay little heed to federalism or separation of powers, that they will lean toward being autocratic, lean toward uh, consolidating more power. And this is even true with Obama, who was elected partly because he said, you know, the Bush administration had gone too far in throwing its weight around, making unilateral decisions. I'm a constitutional law professor, I'll be different. And then he expanded, extended, and enlarged many of the same problem programs, right? right? right. Hope and change. Uh, yeah, but, well, you know, we've, there's still uh, 2020, right? You've refused to endorse Trump so far, and you recently denounced uh, his claims that Ted Cruz's father was involved in the assassination of the, uh, of the Kennedy assassination as part of the reason. What are the other reasons you're reluctant to endorse uh, uh, Trump? And is there anything that he can do to win your vote or your endorsement? And if not, break some news right now. In looking for a presidential candidate, who could win my support. I'm always looking for someone who will say, I will restore federalism and separation of powers. Here's what I will do to do that. Here's my formula. I'll start with the Reins Act. I'll, I'll push the Separation of Powers Restoration Act, getting rid of so-called Chevron deference in the courts. Uh, I, I will push power back to the states. I will veto anything that transgresses my more limited interpretation of the Commerce Clause and or of the Spending Clause. And here's where I think uh, we've deviated uh, from our interpretation so of those provisions. So does this mean you're endorsing Gary Johnson right now or you're just not going to write in anybody for president? I'm looking for a candidate <laughs> who will do that. And uh, uh, I'll do everything I can to find and support candidates who will do that. Final question. You were part, I mean, you're one of the poster boys of the Tea Party, uh, you know, because you you know, very clearly articulated the idea the government is spending too much, it's doing too much, we have to stop and start reducing that. Is the Tea Party a spend force in American politics, or what has happened to it? Because it, man you know, uh, it seems like it was a long time ago that p anybody was talking about that, both Trump and Hillary Clinton in their uh, budgets that they announced, uh, they increased spending from over 22 percent of GDP as a percentage of GDP to even higher. Um, Tea Party, does it still matter? Nobody's sure what the term Tea Party means. One of the problems in it is, is that they, nobody controls the brand name mm -hmm. Tea Party. Another problem is nobody can really agree on what it is, what it meant. It was a term that people came to associate with the grassroots conservative political phenomenon that started manifesting itself arguably in 2008, uh, at least by 2009, uh, that, that swept a lot of people into uh, Senate and House elections in 2010 and 2012. Um, look, that phenomenon is still out there. Uh, people tend not to refer to it as the Tea Party movement anymore. I, I tend to call myself a constitutional conservative. Mm -hmm. I think that's just what best describes me more than any other single label. But the, the sentiments are still out mm -hmm. there. It's just the, they go by different names. Do you worry at all that the Republican Party is, uh, is, is dying? Is the future of the Republican Party to become more libertarian in terms of reducing the size, scope, and spending of government? I, I think the future of the Republican Party depends on its ability to simplify, to, to identify a concise mission statement. And here's where constitutional conservatives and libertarians uh, can merge their efforts to help move the Republican Party or move something in that direction, whether it's the Republican Party or, or uh, just the conservative movement as a whole, to move the country in, in the right direction. 
Because constitutional conservatives and libertarians both understand we've got to simplify. The, the federal government is too complex. It's doing too many things it was never intended to do. And a government that's that big, that takes that much of your money, that uh, is big enough and powerful enough to spy on you, to lie to you, to target you, is a government that we ought not have in the first place. So I, I, I think there's a lot of good that conservatives, uh, constitutional conservatives and libertarians can do if we can steer this ship in the right direction simply by uh, simplifying uh, what we're doing, simplifying the whole purpose of the federal government. All right, well, we will leave it there. The book is The Lost Constitution. It is out in paperback now. We've been talking with Senator Mike Lee of Utah. He's a Republican, and he's heading up something called the Article One Project that would radically alter and revise what government does. Senator, thanks for talking to us. Thank you. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.